I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guests today are Drs. Avi Sakatapulu and Jonathan House. They are co-organizers of the upcoming conference, La Planche in the States. It is a virtual conference being held on October 2nd and 3rd. It's called La Planche in the States, the Sexual and the Cultural. For more information, you can visit their website, laplancheinthestates.com. You can also email them at laplancheinthestates at gmail. Dr. Avi Sakatapulo is a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst. Originally from Greece and Cyprus, She's now based in New York City and teaches at the New York University postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, as well as at other institutes. Dr. Jonathan House is a medical doctor who teaches at Columbia University and the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, as well as the Center for Psychoanalytic Training and Research. He practices psychiatry and psychoanalysis in New York City. He is the editor-in-chief at Unconscious in Translation a publishing company specializing in psychoanalytic books and the main publisher of Jean Laplanche's work in English. Visit their website, uitbooks.com. Rendering Unconscious is also a book Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Published by Chapart Books, 2019. For more information, you can visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast at our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a 23-c-a-r-l that's patreon.com forward slash vanessa 23 carl your support is so appreciated it's invaluable and i want to take a moment to thank all of our patreon patrons for helping make rendering unconscious podcasts possible For more information, you can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net. You can sign up for my newsletter there at the contact page to stay apprised of upcoming events and publications. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at rawsin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore at Twitter and Instagram. As always, there is a video of this episode on YouTube. Just look for Trapart Films YouTube channel. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T Film at YouTube. You can also search for Rendering Unconscious Podcast at YouTube. Well, uh, you know, I've, I've talked about La Planche a bunch and often start out by talking about how I got interested in his work and then how I, we developed this uh, epistolatory romance uh, and uh, it, it ended up meeting him and then asking me to Effect beyond the Conseil Scientifique of his foundation in charge of the English translations. 
but I, I find I've grown tired of repeating that story. And I, I'd rather um, begin by talking about uh, when I first met Audrey, and uh, what uh, she a little while ago called our, our origin story. Um, and uh, which sounds very dignified to me, I like that. And uh, so what it was, was I was presenting a, a paper on, on Apreku, uh, more or less the thing that, on Apreku that was in Japa. Um, and uh, the discussant was Audrey. And what I remember, two things about her discussion, one is that she immediately took it into the realm of uh, social change, uh, which happens to be, you know, be important to me and to the conference that we're talking about. Which, uh, and uh, the other thing that she did, so I can sneak this in and I'll talk about social change. You want to know about social change on the point come to the conference, right? But um, I, forget what word it was, but I, I asked her uh, after she gave her commentary, I said, have you by any chance just been reading the Socratic dialogue, the Theotetus, which is the place that he first says uh, that wonder is the um, origin of philosophy, which Aristotle also says, and which is usually translated wonder. Obviously, you talk about this. I don't know, you know, Greek. Um, but there is an American translator who translates it in the form of a kind of uncomfortable dizziness uh, as wonder. And uh, so I thought of wonder, curiosity, awe. And uh, I think that this is La Planche, and it's where Avji expands upon it a little bit later after I met her uh, momentarily. It's, um, it's uh, wonder as an aspect of what drives, what pushes, maybe I should say, or anyway, why humans, I would argue instinctually, and I think translate, they want to understand what Jonathan Lear calls in this Aristotle book, The Desire to Understand. I see that all the same, where um, Avji adds, and without subtracting to that, is her paper on overwhelm, and uh, which I think is actually an important addition to our conceptual apparatus. Does it overlap with Laplanche and Freud, yeah, of course, you know, otherwise be off somewhere else. But it's precisely what is it under traumatic circumstances as well as big and large traumas, uh, trauma is even the right word always, that uh, pushes us to try to understand, to translate. In fact, if you want another word, Laplanche, you could throw in enigmatic, right? It's, what, what on earth does that mean? It's confusing. And it op in the sense of opening up, not of something that has one answer. Um, and so where I find myself in total agreement with what I've been writing about for a while now is in this area of overwhelm, curiosity, wonder, getting mad. Um, and it's also then where we can most excitingly disagree with each other as long as we got, you know, the bottom line there. So what I'm excited about the conference in, is that, but also that really under Abji's leadership, the conference has moved towards the other thing that excited me in that initial encounter which is seeing the connection in La Planche uh, to the, in addition to our ability to understand things in a way that makes changing the world to a better place possible. You know, remembering that he comes out of 
philosophy and then Marx and only then Freud and psychoanalysis. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, I think that's what the conference is going to at least more than half open up in these interesting directions. And I should not get any credit for that at all. <laughs> so with with putting putting you on the spot, Audrey, there you are. Well, it's uh, it's very interesting to hear you uh, to hear how our origin story um, tracks for you, Jonathan. Because for me, it starts with an even earlier moment where you read something that I had discussed in Java and invited me to dinner. And I remember we sat down and we had a very long dinner during which we were both getting more and more excited about ideas and talking about Laplanche. And I was, of course, also really um, kind of like awestruck that you had contacted me and wanted to have dinner with me. And then we started the conversation. We were just talking about theory. And that was such a delight. Um, and then when you raised the issue about Theotetus and Socrates, um, I had not read that dialogue since I was like maybe an adolescent where we studied some of these dialogues in school in Greece where I grew up. And I went back and looked at the text that you had, the dialogue that you were, had in mind, and I read it in English, and I also read it in Greek. Um, which, so, of course, our origin story would have something to do with translation baked into it right from the start. And I remember, like, you and I were having this conversation about the world overwhelm, but also, like, the choice. I hadn't yet published that. Uh, yeah. And you and I were in conversation, and you were proposing other ways, other words, perhaps, and... I was kind of like swirling in that. And the word in Greek about all is the this we're describing is skotodhini. And skotodhini is a particular kind of vertigo that has, it's made up, the word is made up of two, it's a synthetic word. It's made up of skotos, which is the darkness. And vini, which is, it can be a whirlpool. It can be a dizziness of sorts. So the, the, the notion of darkness and the, the, the notion of being pulled into something vertiginous that then can create something new, that it is out of the anxiety and what on some level can look like destructiveness, but which is not necessarily destructiveness. One of the insights that Laplanche has been like very generative for me for has, this, has been this play between what we might, what in some ways of reading Freud and definitely in Klein reads as pure destructiveness. In Laplanche, it's also a space of possibility, um, a space of possibility that passes through difficulty. So I remember like when I read that, like the emphasis on that, that you were bringing now conversations to that was in the awe. Um, and, and that had a very big impact on me. I've often thought back to that discussion. Um, so in some sense, when we started talking about doing the conference together, like I felt that um, we could bring, we could, what could syndicate in this conference would be both a very rigorous study of Laplanche um, and what he had to contribute on his own terms and also how to put him to work in the way that he put Freud to work and how to put him to work, not through other metapsychologies, but also through kind of like, um, creating a little bit of a, throwing him off orbit to, to go back to the Ptolemaic um, and Copernican models that he so works with by, by refracting him through different discourses. Hence our emphasis in this conference on critical race theory, on queer of color critique, um, queer theory um, and, and philosophy and the metapsychology and the, the philosophical systems and discourses with which Laplanche is very engaged, but psychoanalysis struggles to engage with um, or is increasingly engaged with it, if we might say differently. So I am very excited to see what comes out of this scotovini, out of this uh, dizziness that we are, in a way, purposefully trying to engage in the conference. I, I, I love, I, I thought that, that he, the professor, the guy who translated it as dizziness, <laughs> is writer than I understood. Uh, and the combination of of darkness and vertigo is is terrific. It, it, I wonder if we 
put it together, what what is it that uh, uh, Sappho talks about the sweet bitterness or the bitter sweetness of the erotic? Mm-hmm. And there's a you know a wonderful book on that. And uh, I'm going to have to see if I can think about these two things together. But that's I'm delighted. I didn't know that. I love that as well. And I love that the conference is happening at this moment now, because I was actually in the previous podcast, which I haven't put up yet. We were talking about this kind of moment and this kind of sense of vertigo, but I, I called it circling the void because I didn't have these words for it. But I love I love having this language for it now. But I feel like as a society, we're kind of in this place as well. Um, and I love that the conference is happening now. It was supposed to happen in 2020, right? Yes. Uh, circling the void, incidentally, is great. You know, I, I, again, I think uh, you can say these are all uh, translations of something that has its uncertainty, enigmatic quality, and that it's precisely that it stimulates, uh, not that we, we could do without incipient fascism, but if we've got it, it stimulates something that uh, needs to be in different ways. uh... I mean, indeed, you're right that the conference was going to happen in 2020 and then the pandemic hit. And also because so much of the conference is organized around both um, um, speakers who are not just in the States and also inviting interests from across the States. I mean, it's La Planche in the States, but really we're hoping that we will have participation and um, conversation from across the world. um, because of that reason, we and everything shut down, we postponed it, and to to protect that possibility, we decided to hold the conference online. Um, and speaking to what you were raising, Vanessa, about kind of like the crisis of the world, um, I mean, there's been many conversations of the notion, like, do we go back to what we had, or do we use this as an opportunity to create something new? And conversations have been happening about that on all kinds of social levels. But part, part of what I think is useful in thinking with Laplanche is his notion of the spiral, that you go both go back and evolve in three dimension, in four dimensional space, like in the, the quality of temporality of the movement forward also has to be considered here because without the crisis, nothing, but also the crisis is not in and of itself enough. Um, and if the crisis does not destabilize as many people have been talking about like the terrible ills that have come out of the pandemic. And I would add Trump to the ills of our time and his afterlife in our social life. Um, um, And of course that is absolutely true. Things have been horrific, but without, I'm I'm very, when I talk about overwhelm, I'm very serious about the horror of it. This is not just a kind of like a, a euphemism. Like it's only out of horror and out of fascism that possibilities can open up where things have become too bound, like through capitalism, through consumerism, through very particular ways of the, the, how the world has been structured, including the world of psychoanalysis, mm-hmm. which even in its progressive movements, moves more towards binding than engaging um, the disturbance uh, and engaging the disturb- disturbance of the sexual um, I mean, in some ways, I would say um, that to develop an aesthetic relationship with disturbance is what psychoanalysis at its best has to offer us as, as patients and as a culture. Um, I, I'm tempted to jump in here. So uh, you connect um, rightly uh, the stasis uh, with capitalism, which of course uh, has its, you know, this notion of change and progress towards, you know, uh, everything getting more and better and that um, as an ideology in it. Um, If Varoufakis is is right, Mm -hmm. and we've moved to some important change from uh, something that looks like capitalism has looked in some ways for a long time, profit-driven 
uh, as we all agree, whether we're for or against, uh, that now we're back to um, or forward to something that he calls uh, uh, techno feudalism. And one of the aspects of that, as I understand it, um, is precisely that it's going to look like feudalism, for instance, in the notion that in feudalism, no one thought there was any possibility of change. You know, you know, you might have a revolution to overthrow the king, but that was not to have the People's Republic of you know whatever. It was to let's get a good king instead of a bad king. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Robin Hood, not the sheriff of Nottingham or whatever. You know. Um, and I wonder if, as we move into a world uh, of Amazon, we still have the repressed, the workers hidden away in those storehouses. Um, will our turf psychoanalysis uh, be affected in some way, or does the possibility of change uh, seem less plausible to those who might otherwise come to people like us to, for whatever reasons they currently come? Will despair and depression? This is such, such an exciting question. Um, you know, this, this narrative of progress, of bettering yourself, self-improvement, narratives around healing, making yourself better, exercising better, eating better, all, all of this um, kind of like neoliberal um, policies or kind of like neoliberal ideologies, they, they draw just, I know that everybody knows this, I'm just going to say to, to, to scaffold my, um, my, my thinking. They, they come, they start out with Adorno says, this is kind of like the, the fallout from the Hegelian dialectic, like thesis, antithesis, synthesis, the notion being that every synthesis moves us further along in developing kind of like, so that we have this now, we end up with this narrative of progress. So part of what Adorno does, and I think that we should do on the level of our metapsychology is put pressure on that progressive narrative. Now, when, when Varoufakis talks about, um, at least the way that I understand the techno feudalism, he talks about the concentration of the power in the few. Like, and the example he brings is he says, we no longer are in capitalism. He says, if you um, capitalism, the idea was that markets compete and you end up with kind of like naturally these different systems are balancing themselves out. But he says, right now, all of these systems belong to the same two or three people. So you don't even have the market of competition. So I'm trying, I've been trying to think, because I'm very interested in Varoufakis' thinking, I've been trying to think, what does that look like in psychoanalysis? And I, I think that what it looks like is that we have this narrative of progress in our theories, that we started with these ideas that were very useful, but crude, but now we have in, 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 inflected them through understandings of the social that actually make us able to think about the social world. But I think that many of these theories even though they look like we have developed in our thinking, have what I would think of as a flaw, which is that they move more and more towards the notion of identity. And that is not compatible with thinking about the enigmatic and the sexual. So I think that we need to, now that we've gone there, I think that we need to move back, de-link or de-translate some of that work that we've done to be able to incorporate the social into thinking about psychoanalysis and, and try to do it differently such that it allows for disturbance and it does not line up in the narratives of rights or equivalence or identity or uh, agency uh, that we have about psychoanalysis. Um, so th this, this would be, th this would be my, my take on this. Like in some way we need a multiplicity of narratives and part of you know, if techno feudalism tells us that all power is concentrated in the few, we need more multiplicity than just these dominant ways of thinking, even within our metapsychology. And th that's why I'm hoping that both conversation is generated, but that in some ways in the conference, we're also putting some discourses on a collision course. And I think that's an exciting and good thing. So if I, if, if it, 
sneak in the slightly different angle then. So there is after all institutional psychoanalysis. Uh, in the United States, uh, there's the American Psychoanalytic Association, which has not for decades and decades in any way, even forget about crazy discrimination, uh, represented a majority of the people who call themselves psychoanalysts. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and is a smaller and smaller organization as some of us buy off. Um, and we, I don't know much, frankly, about the IPA other than what we all read, although I was just elected one of the North American representatives. And what I said in running, thank you very much, what I said in uh, running was I, I thought the key element was to find ways to integrate not only clinicians who are no, not yet part because they choose not to be or for one or can't be for our rules, uh, but also like our conference to be able to find ways to integrate people who are not clinicians. You know, think how little of Freud is actually about his clinical work, you know, and all of that in the innate to help discuss theory. Um, you know, we, we want the kinds of people that uh, will be at the conference. And what does that mean? And think of the, you know, the history of um, exclusion and sectarianism and yet, one also wants some kind of rigor. You know, I don't think that Aaron Beck uh, uh, regrets saying, I'm not doing psychoanalysis anymore, I'm doing CBT. You know, and he, he was an analyst. And he said, no, this is not necessary, and I'm abandoning it. So without getting into the incredibly boring topic of, you know, defining psychoanalysis, you know, but... Uh, we still want to be able to distinguish what is and isn't X, call it psychoanalysis, but in a way that allows us to involve the people, the ideas, the domains that mm -hmm. are going at the conference and that you were, you were just talking about. Yeah. Um, I don't know if either, either of you, I mean, I mean these podcasts precisely involve all sorts of people, including people you should never invite. They're terrible people. Why do you let them talk? But you know, this is uh, this is great, right? This is this is what we've got to be doing. This is the multiplicity, uh, I think, that that we need. You know, um, Jonathan, I'm thinking about what you're saying about like exclusion and who has been historically excluded, both in terms of disciplinary formations, like we only talk to analysts, the question of lay analysis, who gets to train as an analyst, but also on the level of, kind of like identity and the subject, like people of color, uh, the ways in which we, it's, it's not subtle how we discourage queer people and especially trans people from training uh, at IPA institutes or having to contribute but I would say also this to go back to the question of identity and pluralism and the, the power in the hands of the few, that to me, an inclusive psychoanalysis that is inclusive just on the level of identity, I think that's an impoverished way of thinking about inclusion. And you're not saying this. I'm just speaking back to. Don't worry about me. Yeah. No, but I'm saying like when I was saying earlier that um, we go too much to identity, this is what I meant. I meant that to bring in a trans person to talk just so that we have a trans person on the panel and not then allow the things that they're saying to shake up how we understand psychoanalysis and just have included in a tokenistic way, a person whose identity marks them as other is to refuse the disturbances that this otherness can bring to our way of thinking. So one of the conversations, Vanessa, that we were having at the beginning when we were describing, discussing how do we, who do we invite and how do we think about it? We, we, played a lot with the notion of like doing if we invite people who only know Laplantian theory or not. And where we landed was we need some people who are familiar with Laplantian theory and who have the rigor 
in this particular study. But we also need people whose ability to shake things up with trust, even if it's not, this is not their domain. So in some way, we wanted to invite that otherness. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking, Jonathan, when you were saying like on the level of the IPA, like I'm thinking there was a recent conversation on the IJP on trans that was curated to be had between two people who are not trans. Um, like I, I was involved in that conversation, so I know it from the inside. And, but without allowing the, the, both the effervescence and the, the upsetting, the unsettling of our discourses around trans to come into the conversation. So if we're trying to keep things the same, but just are inviting more people to tell us the same thing, that's not an inclusive psychoanalysis, that is a superficially inclusive psychoanalysis. Um, so this is, this is how, uh, this is a long-winded way to get from Hegel to Adorno <laughs> to Varoufakis <laughs> and to psychoanalysis. <laughs> I don't, I don't I don't know if there's one sentence that could do it so this is this is perfect uh, but the, Vanessa before we get completely lost in our own thing uh, give us a hint of something that we should have at oh I love your dialogue absolutely um well why don't you tell us exactly when the conference is so people know it's in October 2nd and 3rd, and it's two full days. One day starts at um, a quarter to nine and ends at around five. Uh, and these are all New York EDT times. Um, and the other day starts at eight. We have a, spot, a bonus session on translation, uh, and it goes up until three or 3.45. I'm not sure. But all the information is on our website, laplancheinthestates.com. Perfect. And Jonathan, we also have to talk about your publishing company. Thank you very much. Yeah, The Unconscious in Translation. Um, this, uh, another, well, I'll tell you a personal story. Uh, I uh, used to be an internist. I, at a certain point, I decided the revolution was unlikely to happen. There was no vanguard party that I thought was not rigid and lunatic or both and uh, that would welcome me and say, well, you live a horrible life, you know, working at this tough working class job, but the support of your thousand loving comrades will be, you know, but your support of your five loving comrades was not convincing enough. So I decided to go to medical school. I went to medical school because I figured I loved psychoanalysis even then, but I thought psychoanalysis, you know, as I once described it to someone who asked me, what, what is a psychoanalyst? I say, it's sort of like being a Rolls Royce mechanic. Um, if you're lucky, right? You can earn a living. But uh, I thought, being a physician would be relatively unalienated. And, and indeed that turned out to be true. So I became an internist and then I had an opportunity to work for the labor movement. I took off one year, it turned into a decade. At the end of that decade, uh, I decided to hell with being socially relevant. I wanna be a psychoanalyst. So I went back and did a, a psychiatry residency in case I couldn't earn a living as a psychoanalyst, I could sell drugs. Turns out I like psychiatry, but, um, and it also turns out I've been very lucky. But as I left the union, my replacement said to me, uh, Johnny, you don't ever get on a ship that hasn't already sunk labor movement psychoanalysis. So a little while back, I was trying to think, well, what's the next completely <laughs> spunk proposition? And it's obviously publishing, right? <laughs> anyway, what, we, what I hope to do before I rest my head on the bosom of Abraham is um, finish getting all of the so far published work of Laplanche translated into English. And... Uh, Along the way, I'm proud 
of some of the other stuff, in particular, uh, published not only Dominique Scarfone's uh, work on, on the planche, but his, his book, The Unpassed, which is an amazing book. And we're about to publish uh, another book, which will be a collection of uh, articles by Dominique um, with commentary and dialogue between Dominique and Abdi. Uh, and this should knock on wood, be out before the conference, but at any rate, it is coming out. And, um, you know, there's some other stuff. We published uh, something by Pontalis, and if we ever, you know, get the support from somewhere, maybe we can do more Pontalis. Uh, and I did a novel, I'm mostly not doing fiction, and uh, I've done some other stuff. But the, the goal was from the beginning uh, to get to get Laplanche into translation, and my agreement with uh, with Laplanche uh, was that probably the best way to do it was in reverse chronological order, and more or less that's what we've done. Um, so what remains are uh, some of the problematique from before eighty seven, I mean, sort of the the hinge of his work uh, is. Uh, before the general theory of seduction and after, going from uh, leaning on uh, to seduction, uh, for instance. Uh, and uh, that's 1987, that's new foundations. Uh, but the stuff that comes before it is invaluable, is really great stuff too. So uh, we should get it done eventually. I look forward to these books. I have almost all of the books on Unconscious and Translation. <laughs> I'm a fan. <laughs> uh, you've won my heart. <laughs> Jonathan, can you say a little bit about, um, uh, about the decision to publish them in reverse uh, chronological order? Well, it, in part, it may have been a bit of an accident. The, the the first thing that I did for my own reasons was to translate that early article by La Planche and Pontalis that comes out at the same time as the vocabulaire, the language of psychoanalysis, um, and uh, it, it's intimately related with, you know, these guys did it. And uh, I had read it in the English, in the IJP uh, translation, which is very good. and. Uh, but I, I was confused by it. And I thought, well, maybe it's a translation. My French isn't good enough to just read it in French and absorb it. So I spent a couple of years at night translating it for myself, really. And that's how my relationship with Laplanche started. I sent him my efforts. Uh, he sent back a very complimentary note, you know, long hand on the letterhead of uh, Chateau Romain, you know, very romantic. And uh, of course, it's not an insult to translate someone's work. And he, you know, very flattering. And uh, and uh, and then he, I offered to translate or really retranslate New Foundations, mm -hmm. although Macy's translation is terrific. But you know, he did it immediately, you know, like within a year after it came out or something. What a mind, you know, Macy had. And uh, I thought. You know, it's out of print and, you know, maybe the new translation. Laplanche wrote me and said, you know, but not much point in another translation of a book that's already out of print in English. So a little bit later, uh, when Sexuality came out uh, in, in, in 07, I think, uh, I quickly translated a couple of chapters, just draft and sent it to him. And he uh, said, here's the book. So to get back to your question, if you look at the, the, the essays, because it's a, it's, it's a collection of essays, right? Like, wow. um, it, it has the quality, uh, I think, that Edward Said spoke of in his posthumously published lectures, uh, Late Style, where he's talking about Beethoven, and music, and literature, and theory, of what happens when people are older, and near death, and, uh, and unfairly summarized that, you know, it's basically, it gets rougher 
less precise but clear. And if you uh, you know take Laplanche's early stuff, I don't know, probably I think one and two, which are great, great works and long and that, and, and pleasure to read, but not easy. And you know, there, as compared to the typical essay in Sexual, which is you know twenty pages, even with large font, big margins. Um, it's uh, it's very clear, um, and I think that the notion that I had at least was to go from sexual to new foundations, but there are a couple of texts that are in the middle there, uh, including what was not initially called Problem of Big Six and Seven. Uh, one is on sexuality, Freud's theories of sexuality, republished as uh, The Temptation of Biology, translated by Donald uh, Nicholson Smith, and um, who translated The Language of Psychoanalysis. And the other is Apreko, um, and uh, translated by yours truly, uh, and, uh, and New Foundations. And then the natural thing is, is to go backwards from there. But really it's, it's because I think why he favored it uh, was because he did understand the general theory of seduction as his uh, most important contribution. And that that's 87 and all that follows. Uh, so that's, that's why reverse the chronological order. You know, the, the way that you're fleshing it out um, brings to my mind the way that Laplanche talks about theory, theory as experience, which is so important. Like a lot of people read Laplanche and understand him as being very cerebral, but I understand him as being like, if you, if you give yourself over to the text, he's, he, he actually means what he says. And what you're describing makes me think of the importance that he places on the après coup. That in some way, of course, if you're translating his works, Laplanche's works, it would make sense that you would not go progressively chronologically and that there would be some movement, on a uh, temporal movement, even as if, if we treat the um, new foundations as, as a kind of like the intervention point, but and that it can progress uh, linearly in, in either direction. So I, I find that actually quite delightful and on that level as well. <laughs> You, you could you could take a quote out of New Foundations where he, he refers to all the problematics he says and he, and he says uh, now the time has come for me to show how these works articulate with each other theoretically. Mm -hmm. Who is in effect saying, look, um, this is the synthesis, the culmination but is utterly connecting it with what comes before mm -hmm. as, as a necessary, as you point, a spiral development, returning to the same themes in a new and way based on the past. Mm -hmm. And that, but anyway, yes, I, absolutely. Mm -hmm. so, Asi, how did you come to psychoanalysis and to Laplanche in particular? Um, into psychoanalysis or Laplanche or both. Yeah. I came. I came to psychoanalysis in a rather uh, bizarre way. Um, I, well, not so bizarre, but it, it proved um, in a way prophetic. I um, I read a book that my mother had on her bookshelf uh, that was um, Marguerite Duras, the word to say it, or Marie Cardinal is the way to say it. And, which is an account of her analysis. Um, and I, I remember like in the first chapter, you meet this um, woman who is suffering from this unexplained hemorrhaging, vaginal hemorrhaging. And she's on her way to her analyst for a first consultation. And she sits down with the analyst and she, by that time, she's very incapacitated. She's agoraphobic and she sits down and recounts all of this dramatic experience in her life. And the analyst says to her, you're going to have to be an analysis. Like this is not something that can be dealt with in a once a week treatment. And she says, and I'm grossly paraphrasing here, some version of um, I'm bleeding. I'm agoraphobic. I could barely, barely make it here. I have no money. What are you even talking about? And he says with a conviction that 
in, in some ways can sound anachronistic, but which at the time felt very inspiring to me and which inspired my relationship with psychoanalysis. He says some version of like, no, this is absolutely necessary. You can hear the exigency here. Um, and she in fact walks out and decides to, the bleeding stops instantly. So there's this magical kind of like ideality of the symptom is lifted. And she, and the rest of the book is of course very boring because it's the recount of the actual treatment. It's not half as exciting as the first chapter. But I remember like reading this book and being extremely thrown that somebody could have so much confidence in what something has to offer that they would say, this is gonna cost you and, and, and you need to consider paying that price even though there are no guarantees. Something about that to me has to do with what we do in psychoanalysis. It's, it's, it, it ties to thoughts about consent that I'm something that I'm very preoccupied with. Um, so I, I knew then that I wanted to be an analyst, even though who knows what it is exactly that that stimulated in me. And the book was on my mother's shelf. And of course, I've given that <laughs> much thought in my, in my own treatment. Um, and then I, um, I discovered Laplanche through misreading him at first. Um, and then reading him again and again. And then I have had the good fortune of studying with Dominique Scarfoni, who has been very influential to me. Um, and whose book, The Unpassed, that uh, Jonathan just mentioned, I think is one of the most brilliant um, interventions that have been made in psychoanalysis. Um, so I was very lucky to study with him. And then I, in, a, in a very casual conversation, he and I were having at a dinner party. I was talking to him about Marie Cardinal. And he said to me, oh, that was, she was analyzed by Michel de Mizan. So Michel de Mizan having had kind of like quite like there's a lot of um, affinity between some of the work that he's doing on quantity and affect and the work that Laplanche is doing. So in some sense, when I said that it was prophetic, it, it kind of like comes full circle that that's the book that stimulated me, um, produced the scotovini, the awe, the dark awe <laughs> that made me want to be an analyst. And then it so happened that there was some connection between the two. Um, and of course, that I learned this through uh, Scafoni, who was also teaching me Laplanche. So there's this convergence, which I, I think is quite interesting, um, which is how I came, um, came to Laplanche. And thankfully, when Jonathan read my discussion and invited me to dinner, he, he read the part that I had not, he read my, my better reading of Laplanche and not my initial <laughs> misreading of him. <laughs> well, as you and I would agree, misreading is a entirely a necessary moment yeah. for all this, but just much more on a banal level, my interest in um, psychoanalysis, or really it was in Freud, comes because on my mother's shelf were the three volumes of Jones's huh. biography, which I never opened. And it was a kid. And, but I asked about psychoanalysis, and someone, maybe probably my mother, explained to me Freudian slip. But what I remember is I thought, yes, if you leave your hat, forget your hat at somebody's house, it means you want to go back and see them again. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, this is the best ever. And that's, that was my entire understanding of psychoanalysis. <laughs> and uh, later, you know, like, you know, it's one of those things. I knew I was a Marxist and a Freudian before I ever read anything of either one of them, you know. And, but then it turned out it wasn't a bad choice, you know. So, uh, but I still remember it was actually my friend Steve Katz, whose hat, whose house I left my hat at I, in my imagination. <laughs> I don't know why I wanted to go back and see him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, let's see what are you all working on now besides the conference is it taking all of your time well I, i'll tell you i'm you know for a while i have had a lot of books that are cooking um and i have actually some of my own stuff that i want to write but uh there's a, a book that also should come out shortly on uh, Beyond and Laplanche, Howard Levine came and presented uh, to the Conseil Scientifique and uh, we 
of the book will have his paper plus responses uh, by uh, people on the Francais. Um, and that is almost done. There's the, the uh, Scarfone's second Hulu book. That's almost done. There is the newly discovered uh, diaries and letters of, of, of Sabina Spielrein uh, to her mother, and it's a German and Russian, wow. which was also almost done, um, newly translated into Russian and into English. Uh, and uh, I, I think that they would be simultaneously published initially, I don't know, six months ago, but in Moscow and New York, but neither mm -hmm. one has happened yet. But that should happen this year. And uh, so I'm involved in, in sort of the publishing angles of that stuff. And occasionally I get a chance to think about writing. And uh, this is not my fault, but I am, I think, the first speaker at the conference. And it's being billed, my talk, as a crash course in Laplanche. Now, often when I tried to do this, like I called it an amuse bouche of Laplanche, you know, something like this. But it's very American, right? That would be a crash course. So, I mean, like this. Uh, so I, I clearly I have to spend the summer writing that thing, right? So that's what I'm doing. It is Laplanche in the States. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, and without your translations and all the work that your that the unconscious in translation is doing as a as a press, we would not be able to have to have access to this text, or none of the conference would be happening. So, your contribution is on multiple levels. I, I'm certainly very grateful to you for these translations, and many people are. <laughs> but how I respond? To that, how I respond to compliments is this? Wait a second. Take <laughs> down, give me details, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, how about you, Avi? Um, I, um, I just finished a book um, that I had been working on uh, using, um, using Laplanche and um, putting some pressure on the notion of trauma um, and then trauma of implantation versus intromission to think about racialization and to think with discourses around Afro-pessimism um, to put um, and to put them in conversation with a queer of color critique. Uh, so the work uh, is a weird Venn diagram between Laplanche, uh, queer of color critique, and um, philosophy, and specifically the work of Georges Bataille, who I think is, to me, after kind of like having given this some thought, like it's it's incredible to me that we're not thinking more in psychoanalysis with Georges Bataille whose economy, whose psychic economy and political um, um, theorizing is very, very compatible with Laplanche with enough difference to put some pressure on him, but also with a lot of um, convergence. So um, I'm very excited about what we might do in psychoanalysis about Bataille. So I just finished this book. I'm working uh, on the conference um, and... Um, I, th I think these are, and I'm doing some work on trans that I've been doing for some time. Griffin Hansbury and I just wrote something together. Uh, and of course, I have had tons of fun working with Dominique Scarfone on his book. It's been such a pleasure um, and really exciting, like really looking forward to to how people, what people will think of that book and our conversations. So that's where I've been. I'm looking forward to all of these. And then after the conference is over and you've all like decompressed, and I'd love you to come back and talk about your work more in the books that are coming out. Would be honored. <laughs> yes, please. Is there anything else that you wanted to be sure to mention that we didn't get to? Since we're coming back, I think we'll, let's, we'll leave it in suspense. The, there is one thing that I would mention about the conference for whoever is interested or considering participating. We're putting a lot of thought into the papers and the responses, but we also expect that a lot will happen in the conversations. So 
There are many people who have a lot to say, very interesting things to say about Lagrange through other discourses who are not in the official roster, but who are, will be participating from the audience. And we want to really encourage people. We have put a lot of time, we have built a lot of time for conversation into the conference. And we believe that a lot of new thinking will be generated in the exchange. Um, so I would like people to think that we have organized this with as an invitation, not just as a come and listen to what people have to say. Um, yeah. So. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to it. I feel like in the recent Division 39 conference that was in March, they they were mindful to do that as well and make sure there was like more conversation happening between the audience and the speakers and of course more people of color. And um, yeah, it was really generative and I felt like it was starting to like turn the field into a different direction that it really needs to go in. Yeah, and Lara Shihai was extremely instrumental to that and like I've taken a lot of inspiration from that. From She's her. the last person I talked to. So we were talking about the void. <laughs> She's amazing. She's like She's really amazing. smart and like really solid. <laughs> awesome. Well, we can stop there then. It was really fun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Drs. Avi Sakatapulu and Jonathan House. To register for La Planche in the States and find out more information about their fantastic lineup of speakers, visit laplancheinthestates.com. That's L-A-P-L-A-N-C-H-E I-N-T-H-E-S-T-A-T-E-S dot -E -E com. The conference is virtual and being held on October 2nd and 3rd this fall. You can also visit Avi's Sakatapulu's website at avisakatapulu dot com. That's A V. G I S A K E T O P O U L O U dot com and visit Jonathan House's publication company Unconscious in Translation U I T Books dot com and now she is here. He is her by Genesis Briar Peoridge and Carl Abrahamson from their album Loyalty Does Not End with Death available from Ideal Recordings. Turn the wheel. Turn the wheel. Turn the wheel. Turn the wheel. 
and this way steer. This way steer. She is here and he is her. She is here and he is her. Identity does not exist. Identity does not exist. She is here. She is here. and he is her. And he is her. Hidden in a lost. Hidden in a lost. Hidden in a lost world's mist. She's here, she's here, and he is here, and he is here. Embrace the future, Embrace the future. And a kiss. And a kiss. Kissed, Kissed. Turn, the wheel. turn the wheel, and this way steer, and this way steer. End all gender, End all gender. missed, Missed. Kiss. Nothing short of a total gender. Nothing short.